Hello everyone, uh, on behalf of the Saudi Society of Dermatology and Dermatologic Surgery, I would like to welcome you all in the live webinar, Dermatology and COVID-19. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, our uh, guest speaker, Professor Mark LePaul, who is a professor and chairman of Dermatology Department at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Professor Mark LePaul is international expert in dermatology and psoriasis research, and he is the past president of the American Academy of Dermatology. Okay, are you all able to hear me? Okay, um, so um, a lot of hysteria began uh, when uh, uh, this uh, case of a patient on Umera died uh, after contracting the COVID-19 patient and the a dermatologist in the Seattle, Washington area sent this around. Now, you know that if there's a pandemic that affects millions of people, and there are also millions of people on biologic therapies for psoriasis, of course, there are going to be some patients on biologics who are affected by the COVID-19 virus. And um, because there is a death rate associated with that, some of those patients are going to be among the ones that died. Uh, and uh, so what we decided to do is to go back and look at all of the pivotal trial data where they reported all of the viral infections that were contracted by patients enrolled in those trials. And they all had a placebo controlled group. And, and admittedly, the trials are 12 to 16 weeks placebo. So, um, but we could at least look at that short period of time and see where there are more upper respiratory tract viral infections in the placebo group compared to the patients on biologics. Um, and so here's the data for the TNF blockers. And what you see here is with the exception of etanercept, uh, where the rate in the placebo group was the same as the rate in the biologic group, um, the rate's a little bit higher in the uh, uh, TNF blockers than in the patients who received uh, placebo. And, you know, the numbers aren't that low. 15% is a, you know, high number, but the point is the placebo rate was high also. Um, they, then you go and look at the IL-23 blockers, including eustachinumab, which blocks 12 and 23. And what you see here is the rate is the same as the placebo rate for most of the drugs. Actually, tildrakizumab, it was even a little lower than the placebo rate. And when you look at the IL-17 blockers, now the infection rate over on the left-hand side was higher, but that's mostly because these patients get yeast infections. When you look at the middle column of upper respiratory tract infections, the rate is the same as the placebo group. For brodalumab, it's even a little bit lower. So, um, so we're not seeing big increases in viral infections with any of the biologics. And certainly the IL-17 and IL-23 blockers look very safe. Um, this is uh, data from uh, looking at serious infections in patients on biologics. It comes from a registry called the Solar Registry, which was sponsored by the makers of Eustachinumab, but it was a very well done, done study. They had up to 8,000 patients followed for up to eight years. Um, and you can see here that the rate of serious infections is the lowest for Eustachinumab. This um, study preceded the IL-17 and IL-23 blockers. In fact, you'll see that the rate for eustachinumab was even lower than patients not on biologics and not on methotrexate. So eustachinumab looks like a pretty safe drug here. Um, now, the, the conclusion from reviewing the data from the pivotal trials is that upper respiratory tract infections and nasopharyngeal pharyngitis are, are common in everybody, uh, but they were no more common in the patients treated with uh, biologics than the placebo treated patients, um, the numbers are small and not significantly different than placebo. With the TNF blockers, they were a little bit higher on average. Now, what do the package inserts say for each of these? This is etanercept, and there's a warning, a black box warning about um, infections and specifically about virus infections and that patients are at increased risk for developing serious infections. And they mentioned specifically uh, hepati viral hepatitis. Um, adalimumab, same box warning essentially as, uh, as etanercept. Uh, infliximab, which is probably the most immunosuppressive of the biologics, 
there's again the black box warning about infection and viral infection and specifically uh, you are warned not to administer infliximab to patients with a clinically important active infection like influenza. And they then, then mention hepatitis B and herpes infection uh, as viral infections. Sertilizumab pegol, again, black box warning about viral infection and specifically mention hepatitis B and influenza. Now, the other biologics, and I'll show them here, do not have boxed warnings. Uh, and forgive me for using the product names. Um, the uh, uh, These all were taken from the package inserts which use the product names. Uh, but notice that the IL-12-23 blocker, the IL-17 blockers, and the IL-23 blockers do not have boxed warnings about infection, nor does a premolast, nor does acetretin. What about uh, methotrexate. So methotrexate has many boxed warnings, including warnings about viral infection, about bone marrow suppression, um, patients with an active infection, the treatment should be discontinued um, if they have severe infections, and they mention specifically herpes simplex or, or other viral infections. Cyclosporin is interesting because again, it has a boxed warning uh, about infections and specifically viral infections, but I will point out that after the SARS epidemic, um, a lot of a lot of articles were written about the role of cyclosporin in actually inhibiting coronaviruses. And this is these are four of many articles that were published on cyclosporin actually fighting uh, viral infections, specifically coronavirus infections. Um, what about patients on uh, Eustachinumab. So Eustachinumab blocks a molecule called P40. We thought that that was IL-12 many years ago. Now we know that it's both IL-12 and IL-23. And this is a series of 141 patients from 30 countries where they identified patients who were getting either recurrent salmonella infections or unusual mycobacterial infections. Um, and, and it turns out that uh, when they looked further, these patients were P40 deficient. They basically were born with a de deficiency of the molecule that Eustachinumab blocks. Uh, and so those patients are only at risk of mycobacterial infections and salmonella infections. And by the way, I am not aware of a single report of salmonella infections in patients who are treated with Eustachinumab or with any of the IL-23 blockers. Um, the way the mycobacterial infections were discovered in these patients is in many countries around the world, they use BCG vaccination, which is a live mycobacterium, and in normal people doesn't do any damage. But when patients developed infections from the BCG vaccination, they were investigated and that's how they found that they were P40 deficient. Um, what about patients who are I being treated with IL-17 blockers? So um, this looked at both mice and humans, and uh, and we know that patients who are born deficient in IL-17 get chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. They have an increase in monilial infections. They also have an increase in uh, dermatophyte infections, uh, uh, tinea corporis, for example. Um, but they do not get an increase in viral infections. Now, there's a drawback to stopping biologic therapies, and I'm I'm going to show you that over the next few slides. Um, this is a study that was done with infliximab that probably demonstrated the point better than any other drug. Um, they designed the study so that patients would get either a fixed dose, and that's the solid yellow or solid um, uh, blue-green that you see here, uh, or they would get it in the, the boxes that have the cross lines. Uh, they would get it when needed, so they'd wait for the disease to come back and then they retreat the patients. And what you see here is that there's as much as a 20% difference in the PASI-75 response. Uh, the patients who got a fixed dose did a lot better than the patients who got the, the drug as needed. Um, in addition, the patients who got the drug as needed had more uh, infusion reactions. Uh, you see here in the three milligram dose, which is the first column, 28.9% uh, of patients developed an infusion reaction compared to 20% of the patients who got the drug as needed. Uh, 
I mean, I mean on a fixed response. So much higher frequency of infusion reactions than the one who got it when the disease recurred, as opposed to getting it on a regular basis. And we actually know the reason for that. When you give the drug on a, an episodic strategy as needed, 38% of patients develop anti-infliximab antibodies. If the patients got a fixed dose, that number was only 11%. So um, it's very clear that if the fixed dose is a better way to go. And if you stop a drug, which we are contemplating doing in these patients, and then restart it when their condition recurs, some of them are going to stop responding to it and they're going to get more reactions. Same thing happens with adalimumab. So here's a study where all these trials are designed the same way. They treat patients, they wait for their psoriasis to go away, and here go away means they achieve PASI 75, and then they take the PASI 75 responders. So you have 100% responding, you wait for the disease to recur, and you retreat them. And what happens is only 80% of patients achieve PASI 75 after stopping and restarting. And the same happens with the uh, etanercept as well. In the solid line, you have 100% of patients achieving a uh, PGA of, of zero or one, clear or mild or better. Uh, and then when you stop and retreat them, you're losing almost 20% of them. Uh, same happens here with sertilizumab, Simzia. Um, if you use the low dose and you, you achieve uh, the endpoint, which I believe was PASI 75 uh, in the circle I'm showing you. When you stop, when so 100% are at PASI 75 when they start. When you stop it, it recurs and then you retreat them. Almost a third of patients stop responding with the low dose. It's 13.5% uh, 13, with the high dose. Um, so again, if you have a drug that's working well, do you really want to stop it and then have the have the drug not work as well. Um, this is the data with ustekinumab. So they uh, took patients who achieved uh, clear or almost clear or mild disease, clear, almost clear or mild, and they took 100% of them at week 12, stopped the drug uh, and gave them placebo. And then when it recurred, they retreated them. They lost about 15% of patients. Uh, with ixekizumab, uh, it, they lost 13%, only 87% now will achieve PASI 75. With um, secukinumab does quite well, almost 95% uh, recapture PASI 75. Verdalumab does very well, um, looking at PASI 90, 100% recapture PASI 90. Um, Uselkumab, 87%, so you're losing 13% of responders. Um, uh, this is uh, data with Rizankizumab, and you're losing more than 16% of responders. And their endpoint here was clear or almost clear. Uh, Tildrakizumab does very well. They recapture 96% of responders at PASI 75. Um, this is data from Dupilumab. And uh, let me uh, have you look at this closely because it's not clear from the graph. So in, re in blue are newly treated patients. And what you're seeing here is that, um, what you're seeing here is that you're getting um, patients who achieve clear or almost clear. It's about 55% of patients. In the blue line are patients who had achieved clear or almost clear. So you started out with 100%, you now stop the drug and only about 55% are achieving clear almost clear. So you're losing a lot of patients, a lot of responders by stopping and restarting dupilumab. So we took all that data, we wrote it up and submitted it to JET. It was actually accepted in less than 24 hours. Uh, and, you know, our conclusion is uh, similar to the conclusion of many of the patient and medical organizations. The IPC actually was the first one to address it. They didn't give a concrete answer. Um, they basically said that patients with COVID-19 infection, that means ones who are actively infected, should discontinue or postpone immunosuppressive medications, and they go on to treat about bi to talk about biologics. Um, as of now, there is insufficient evidence to determine how COVID-19 will impact psoriasis patients on systemic treatments. And I have to say, you know, COVID-19 is a new virus, so we don't really still 
know the answer for sure, but we can make an educated guess. And our educated guess was what the National Psoriasis Foundation and the American Academy of Dermatology agreed on. Um, they do not recommend that all patients stop biologic therapy. Individuals should stop biologics if they develop active COVID-19 infections. And certainly if somebody is high risk, a patient has hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and, and is elderly and male, uh, that's a very high risk uh, group of patients, um, should raise the question with their uh, dermatologist. But I can tell you that in my practice, we encourage patients to stay on their treatment unless they develop active uh, infection, regardless of their risk factors. We do warn those patients to take extra care in isolating themselves. Um, it goes on to say there's insufficient evidence to recommend discontinuation of biologics, and you should weigh the risk versus the benefits. This is the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's the AAD, insufficient evidence to recommend discontinuation of biologics, weigh the risk versus benefits. In patients who are positive, discontinue or postpone the biologic, and again, have a discussion with high-risk patients. The International Eczema Council actually went a little bit further. They said, controlled asthma is a risk factor for more severe COVID-19 pneumonia and potentially treating with dupix, dupilumab um, may actually benefit those patients. So why would we stop it? Now they're saying continue systemic treatments during the um, COVID-19 infection, even in infected patients should be considered. They're not saying to do it, but saying to consider it. Um, uh, they uh, also talk about tapering it if patients are on chronic steroids, and they also talk about um, a too rapid a reduction may have a negative effect on respiratory symptoms. Okay, um, uh, this is hot off the press. It is not yet published. It's going to come out in the uh, online version of JAD. They sent a, a blast notice about it today, but this came from um, the Italian experience in Verona. And what uh, Professor Gisandi and his colleagues reported, they had in Verona 3,199 infected patients that were tested test positive, and it was 1.2% of the population. They had 980 psoriasis patients on biologics. There were no hospitalizations or deaths among those patients. 243 renal transplant patients. One patient was hospitalized for, fever, hospitalized for fever and pneumonia, but recovered fully. The prevalence of obesity, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, which are all risk factors for a bad outcome, was higher in the psoriasis patients and in the transplant patients than in the general population. Um, and they were also, they were older and they were more, uh, more likely to be male in the psoriasis patients. Um, and here's the data that they got. Look at the bottom line, which is deaths. There were no deaths in the biologics patients, no deaths in the renal transplant patients. 227 deaths or 0.08%, small number, but uh, a real percentage in the, uh, a real number in the general population. Uh, look at the number above that, the proportion of patients hospitalized, none in psoriasis patients on biologics, 0.4% in the renal transplant patients, 0.2% in the general population. All right, let's talk about the features now of uh, coronavirus. And, you know, you probably are as expert at this as, uh, as I am. Uh, but if a patient doesn't have fever, they could still have coronavirus infection because many patients are asymptomatic. But of the ones who are sick, 98% have fever. These are the ones who are admitted. Uh, of the ones, 76% of patients have cough. If someone does not have fever or cough, I'm thinking about other things. The other symptom that's not listed here is loss of taste or smell. And I've had a few patients who only had loss of taste and smell, and they proved to have coronavirus infection. Um, but, um, uh, and actually uh, one of the patients had what I call COVID toes, which I'll show you pictures of in a minute. He actually called me up for a derm consult and we were on a telederm consult with him and he showed me his COVID toe and, and then told me he didn't have uh, taste or smell, but did not have fever or cough. Myalgias and fatigue, which are common in the flu are common here. Um, many of the patients had sputum production and oops, lymphopenia occurred in, um, 
Lymphopenia occurred in 63% of patients. Um, of the patients admitted, pneumonia was the cause of demise. Uh, uh, and here is the, was the cause of admission in these uh, patients from China. Okay, um, in their report, there were no children or adolescents, but you know now that you can get a Kawasaki-like syndrome in patients, in children exposed to COVID-19. And those children can be, uh, we've had children uh, over as old as eight years old or even older um, who had, certainly eight years old, who had Kawasaki syndrome. They had conjunctivitis um, and they had some, uh, uh, some of the other symptoms of not only Kawasaki syndrome, but also of COVID-19 infection. Um, and the worry there is cardiovascular disease, just as it is with Kawasaki syndrome. Um, uh, the median age of their patients was 49. Um, 73% was, were male. Uh, at least ha less than half had underlying diseases, including diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. Um, these were all admitted patients, and a third were admitted to an ICU, and 15% died, six died. Okay, so um, these are pictures of the skin lesions that have now become common. Uh, to see in patients with COVID-19. Uh, they get something we call COVID toes, which you see on your right. And that appears to be due to a coagulopathy, uh, which diminishes circulation to the toes and looks like something that in the US we would call frostbite. You probably don't get that in Saudi Arabia, but you see a loss of circulation to the distal toes. That's uh, This is taken from the web. Uh, and then a livido reticularis-like pattern uh, again, taken from the web that you see here on the left-hand side. And I would say that these are very specific for COVID-19 infection. Um, then there are some generalized uh, urticarial eruptions, which you see here. Uh, erythematous macules and papules, which you see here. Uh, and um, uh, and, and uh, we'll show you some more. There are also vesicular eruptions. And in the last one, you see that there's some crusting. Most of what has been called vesicular eruptions that I've seen have not looked like varicella. In varicella, you see real vesicles, lesions in all stages. You see vesicles, crusts, pustules, all at the same time. We don't see that. Um, so it is very different than varicella, but um, you can get vesicles that rapidly crust. Um, these are more COVID toes, which you see, and COVID fingers. This is a patient who clearly has a larger vessel vasculopathy with an area of necrosis. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, publication that came out of one of the universities which showed the various eruptions. So I've shown you urticaria, acral ischemia, which we call COVID toes, morbilliform eruptions, with our, which are red macules and papules. The libido reticularis, I think, is quite specific. Um, uh, vesicles have been seen, but when you look even at this photo, they're mostly crusted papules and petechiae have been reported as well. Now, here's a patient that we just submitted a report on. This is a patient with uh, clearly involvement of the fingers, um, and we treated the patient with enoxaparin, Lovenox, and with um, and, and actually the, his internist treated him with Lovenox. We gave him topical nitroglycerin ointment. And in two days, you see this dramatic benefit, a clearly be, uh, better perfusion of the digits. So on the left-hand side is the pre-treatment photo, on the right-hand side, the post-treatment photo. And that again is the intervention there is enoxaparin, which is an anticoagulant and topical nitroglycerin ointment. Okay, what about treatment? So, you know, many of you have probably seen our uh, president uh, who made some foolish remarks about, uh, you know, giving systemic Clorox and Lysol, to, which are disinfectants to patients. Uh, certainly, I hope no one's doing that. Uh, and the other thing that everyone is doing is uh, protective gear. So first of all, what's the evidence that protective gear works. And there's actually a beautiful paper that was published after the SARS epidemic, another coronavirus, and they looked at the risk, what was the impact of difficult, different physical interventions on the likelihood of developing SARS. Um, so if you hand washed more than 10 times a day, you reduced your risk by more than 50%, 55%. Uh, 
If you wore regular masks, not N95 masks, you reduced your risks by two thirds. Um, if you wore N95 masks, you reduced your risks by over 90%. And I'm just going to say, there's a tremendous amount of bad science out there. People saying that masks don't work. People saying that, oh, if you use them after three hours, they're no good. That's baloney. Uh, you know, they're basically making it up. Clearly, if you put on an effective barrier, you're preventing large droplet exposures. And with the N95, you're even preventing most small droplet exposures. Um, wearing gloves reduced the risk by 57%. And wearing gowns reduced the risk by uh, 77%. And I will say, you know, in dermatology, generally, you don't wear gowns. We wear our white coats. Um, uh, when I go home, uh, I have a bag at the doorway. I take off my clothes, put on a new set of clothes, and and that clothes is washed that night. That's my gown. So um, I do all of these things to prevent contracting the coronavirus. So combined, you know, N95 obviously is the best, but hand washing masks, gloves, and gowns combined over a 90% reduction in the risk of developing uh, COVID-19, uh, 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 SARS. And you can extrapolate that quite well to coronavirus. Now, what about, you know, pieces of paper that you deal with, cardboard boxes that you deal with. Well, this was came from the University of Alabama, and uh, this is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, on copper, the coronavirus lasts only up to four hours. In the air, it lasts for three hours. On cardboard boxes, up to 24 hours. On plastic, 72 hours. And on stainless steel, up to 72 hours. So. Um, many of my patients will have their uh, meals, their food shipped to them or clothing. They either disinfect the boxes, they use wipes on the boxes, or they le let the boxes sit if they're not spoilable items in there for three days before opening them up. Okay, social distancing again is, uh, is key uh, because if we keep that six foot distance, we are less likely to transmit it to our colleagues um, uh, and our neighbors. Um, and then there are many questions uh, that we will talk about. Um, this is an email that I got. And honestly, we're not going to know the answers till this is all over. But I have patients with bullous pemphigoid. What's safer, steroids and mofetil or prednisone? I don't know the answer. Here they thought about putting the patient on Dapsone. One of the problems with Dapsone is it requires frequent blood testing. So do we put that patient at risk by bringing them in more often for blood testing? In New York, because the healthcare system was so overwhelmed, we couldn't send nurse blood drawers and nurses to the home to draw bloods. If patients needed bloods, they had to come in. So, um, uh, you know, so, so, you know, the second piece of this is what's more dangerous. Uh, mycophenolatmofetil, prednisone, or uh, rituximab. Uh, and actually last night, I sent a patient to the ER who I could hear was short of breath on the telephone. He had cough, loss of, sm loss of taste and smell, a fever of 102. He was elderly and male. Um, and uh, we brought him to the ER in the evening. At night, he would had a, a chest x-ray that didn't look bad. His oxygenation was good, so they sent him home last night. He had gotten rituximab two weeks ago, and he was on a very low dose of prednisone because, you know, rituximab doesn't work that quickly. He's on three milligrams a day of prednisone uh, and on a small dose a day of uh, mycophenolic mofetil, I believe one gram a day. So um, fortunately, he was doing OK. But uh, the, he was a patient. I said, you've got to isolate yourself at home and do everything possible to not get this virus. But he got it. Now, what about treatments? So there's a lot been written about hydroxychloroquine. And it's interesting. The um, a lot of this, uh, there's a lot of very bad science here. Um, so I will say I, sp I um, was in a meeting where the head of the respiratory effort, the pulmonary effort in China, uh, claimed that they had done a randomized trial with hydroxychloroquine uh, and get very believable results showing that hydroxychloroquine dramatically 
it reduced the shedding of the virus and had better outcomes. Um, they then did these studies in France. And if I were a French doctor or a patient, I wouldn't want a placebo at that point. You already have data that it works. So they didn't have it placebo controlled. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, you see here in the black line are the patients who receive placebo. And in the, um, and this actually uh, was open label. So they simply weren't, they didn't receive placebo, they weren't treated. In the red line were people who received hydroxychloroquine. And you can see that they stopped shedding the virus sooner. When you add azithromycin, which unfortunately, together with hydroxychloroquine, causes prolongation of the QT interval and may make the patient prone to cardiac arrhythmias and death. But when you combine those two, the shedding is completely gone by day five. Now, um, uh, this came, so so the question then becomes, uh, and this data has been questioned. Uh, there's a re recent article that was accepted in the New England Journal of Medicine, which came from um, Wake Forest. And what they did is they looked at a large number of patients, some, some of them treated with hydroxychloroquine, some of them not, and they reported their results. Well, the reason that that is a very bad way to look at it is at Mount Sinai, we have in, in, the, in America at the beginning of this, there was a shortage of hydroxychloroquine. So when patients came in and were very ill, they were treated with hydroxychloroquine. If they were healthy, they were not. So of course, the ones treated with hydroxychloroquine are gonna do worse. Um, and you know, it seems to me an article like that would never have gotten in the New England Journal of Medicine in the past, but it did. So uh, there's a lot of bad science out there. And I don't know if hydroxychloroquine works or not, but I do know that there's a lot of bad science, science out there. Um, so um, here's a question though. You know, we know that um, anti-malarials have been reported to exacerbate psoriasis. And um, so there've been a number of articles written about this. Uh, this one published in 2006 say there's no strong evidence to refute or support the role of anti-malarials in exacerbation of psoriasis. I believe they do exacerbate it. Here's a study by Man Manuel Kuflick, which reported it worsening in 41.7%, but it wasn't severe exacerbation, and he says that it's not strongly contraindicated. Okay, um, a couple of uh, other quick points. You've heard that ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor bo blockers uh, make COVID-19 worse. We know that they inc that ACE2 is ne is a receptor that's needed for an enzyme that's needed for coronavirus to bind to target cells, cells and ACE inhibitors and ARBs and glitazones and ibuprofen increase ACE2. But when they looked at this in patients who were on those drugs, they did not do worse. They actually did better. Same with spironolactone, which increases ACE2. Uh, it, it's been thought actually, here's the question, can it induce ARDS? And, you know, and now they're um, uh, asking, should it be tr used to treat, to prevent COVID-19 infection? Uh, ivermectin also is a drug that we use that has been shown to inhibit the replication of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and remdesivir is now proven. Uh, that's a potent antiviral that has been shown to help this. So I'm gonna close with, um, a couple of questions. Um, here's one that we received on a 28 year old patient with psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis who's being treated with sertolizumab pegol. And the question to me is because TNF blockers have been associated with slight increase in viral infections, should we switch this patient to an IL-17 blocker? And she doesn't want to switch because she's thinking of becoming pregnant. And as you know, uh, sertolizumab pegol is the one biologic we have that does not cross the placenta. So two points here. One is that IL-17 blockers would be a good choice, but she's female, she's young, so she is not at high risk. Uh, and um, so the risk to her would be minor and either option would be good, continuing her on sertolizumab or switching to an IL-17 blocker. Okay, some quick points about the management of patients. I see I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna go through all of these. 
um, and hopefully I'm, I'm welcome. I'm delighted to answer any questions about how we handle different circumstances in our office. I'm just going to race through these, um, but I'm conclude, going to conclude with this quote. Many of our patients are holding their injections because they're getting mixed messages from their physicians. This is crazy. A few weeks ago, we would never have considered patients on IL-17 or IL-23 blockers to be immunosuppressed. The, her- the hysteria surrounding COVID-19 has made us think irrationally. And then I had one funny quote, which I'll end my lecture with. Can we uninstall 2020 and reinstall it again? I think it has a virus. Thank you very much. And remember social distancing. Okay. I'll open it now uh, for uh, questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Mark LePau, for uh, this comprehensive and uh, informative uh, presentation. I think we have a few questions. Uh, uh, we have more than uh, 700 uh, attendees for this, uh, for this uh, presentation, so hopefully we could have some time for our questions. So there's a question here uh, from uh, Dr. Adana Risa. Uh, thanks for a great talk. What do you think Thank about you. Uh, the reliability of the serology testing? There are uh, some patients with positive PCR and testing negative for serology. Yeah. Um, why, so, oh yeah why some patients who, positive, who are positive uh, to COVID-19 and uh, treated became negative and after exposure? To, uh, so she's wondering about sorry, the reliability of you know, let me answer the first question and then tell me the second part. Um, sure. We have probably more than 10 tests in the U.S. There's one that was developed at Mount Sinai. We think that it's accurate, um, but it's very clear that there are not only false negatives, there are false positives too. So the testing is not 100% reliable, but it's reasonably reliable. Um, you know, I will say we also have patients who have antibodies and are still PCR positive in the nose. So you can get the virus again. Uh, um, the, um, the PCR test in the nose has about a 30% false negative rate. So there are patients who clearly have coronavirus and it doesn't matter what the tests say. If they lost their sense of smell and taste, they've got coronavirus. And even if the test is negative, they still have to isolate themselves. And in fact, one of the questions that I didn't answer there was um, when we have a patient who has symptoms of a cold, a sore throat or a cough or a running nose, uh, we actually tell them to go home and we assume that they have had coronavirus because even if the test comes out negative, there's a 30% false negative rate and we do not want them around our patients. Is there is a second part to that question? Um. I think that's the question, but there is another question about uh, what is the role of cyclosporin uh, uh, in psoriasis patients? Shall patients positive with COVID-19 to continue cyclosporin or should be, I mean, the management plan should be different? Yeah. So what all of the medical and patient organizations are recommending is that immunosuppressive therapies like cyclosporin be discontinued. I did show you several patients, which were mostly animal studies um, uh, and in vitro studies, which showed that cyclosporin has a good uh, impact on uh, coronaviruses. It has an anti-coronavirus effect. In addition, I showed you the transplant article that's going to be published any day uh, from Verona, uh, showing that transplant patients did very well. So, you know, theoretically, we would not have to continue cyclosporin but right now, we don't know that answer. And the guideline from patient organizations is immunosuppressive therapy should be discontinued. Yeah, there's a question about the role of Dapsone and, cyclo- and doxycycline in, in, in COVID-19. Do they have a role in the treatment of COVID-19? Um, I, I'm not aware of any studies that looked at their effectiveness in COVID-19, doxycycline or Dapsone. Another question about uh, what could be the mechanisms of the new skin signs of COVID-19? So we're pretty sure that it's related to the coagulation abnormality that these patients have. And when you look at various organs, including skin biopsies, uh, and this is from an expert uh, pathologist in Italy, they have microthrombi. And we think that it's a reduction in circulation because of those microthrombi. That's probably why that patient 
treated with enoxaparin and uh, nitroglycerin paste got better. There is a question about uh, a relationship between the loss of smell and COVID-19. Is there any explanation for this? You know, uh, I'm going to be guessing here. Again, I would assume that it's a thrombotic event that hit whatever um, receptors or nerve is responsible for taste and smell. But I'm guessing. I don't know the answer. We have a question about uh, a new patient who is in need for uh, biologic treatment, a psoriasis patient. What could be the approach here and with, the, with this pandemic of uh, co- I mean, the COVID-19? So it depends on how bad the patient is and what condition they have. If they are completely debilitated, that probably is more immunosuppressive than any drug we have. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, this conversation comes up with atopic dermatitis patients, for example, dupilumab is a, uh, there's no evidence that it is immunosuppressive. If you biopsy the skin and measure IL-4 levels in atopic dermatitis patients, they're sky high. If you give them dupilumab, they don't go down to zero, they go down to normal levels. So we're not making those patients immunosuppressed, we're making them normal. Um, So, uh, uh, and I mentioned also the tie with dupilumab and asthma. So imagine a patient with horrific Uh, uh, atopic dermatitis. That is debilitating and frankly makes them susceptible to everything, uh, to bad outcomes with everything. And so normalizing those patients, I think, is heroic. I think you should be doing that. Um, As for psoriasis, again, it depends how bad it is. If it is really awful, then those patients are sick and you need to actually treat them. If it is not, You have the option of, I showed you the data, I think the 17 and 23 blockers are safe. You could use those um, uh, and uh, and probably not harm them at all. Um, Although we don't know that for sure yet, that's probably gonna end up being the case. Um, And I did show you the data from Verona, patients on biologics are not more prone to bad outcomes. A question about phototherapy uh, during COVID-19 for psoriasis patients. What could be the so, You know, I have a number of companies calling me and I, I almost think it's uh, silly uh, because they think that phototherapy is going to cure coronavirus. And in fact, ultraviolet light kills the coronavirus, but it doesn't kill the coronavirus in your lungs or in your brain or in your kidneys. It kills the coronavirus on your skin. So, um, you know, so, so I, I don't think that ultraviolet light Uh, therapy is a cure. And of course, as long as you do social distancing and you prevent interactions, we have a few patients who we have continued on phototherapy. The um, issue for those patients is social distancing. Every patient who leaves our phototherapy unit, we disinfect the box afterward. We wipe down all the bulbs on the floor afterward. So we're down to only a few few visits a week from hundreds of visits a week before. There's a question about alopecia areata patients, patients on JAK inhibitor. Do you recommend to continue or discontinue this uh, therapy? So um, what I've done is the same thing that we do for the biologics. Basically, uh, there is some evidence that baricitinib might actually be helpful in COVID-19 infection. Um, That's the only one I know any data on. If patients are not infected, we continue them on the drug, but we tell them to self-isolate dramatically because we assume that they are more at risk than other patients. We don't know that, but we assume it. Um, So, but we do, we don't necessarily stop their um, JAK inhibitor. One thing you know happens if you stop JAK inhibitors in patients with alopecia areata, their hair falls out again. Uh, there's a question here. Why some patients who who's positive to COVID-19 and treated became negative and after exposure to other positive patients become negative again? Is there mutation in the virus that uh, that uh, more become worse and harmful to people? So uh, repeat that question from the start again. Uh, I didn't quite understand it. Yeah, why some patients who are positive to COVID-19 and treated, they become negative. And after exposure to other positive patients, they became positive again. Right, that's correct. 
So they are asking about the explanation for this. Is is it related oh, to the no, mutation? I, I, I don't know that we can attribute that to an, a mutation. Uh, you know, with, I hope that it's that it's not that that's not the answer because we're hoping that there will be a vaccine. Um, although we do know that there are mutations in the COVID-19 virus, um, uh, I think you know the question is: Are the antibodies that that patient uh, probably had, even if they tested negative, are those antibodies protective? And we know for sure that the natural antibodies that we get, and I'm not talking about a vaccine, the natural antibodies um, are probably helpful, but they are not fully protective because I have patients who are antibody positive and still have PCR positive uh, cultures when taken from their nasopharynx. So Mark, if you could please uh, uh, close the uh, stop sharing of your slides so they, I mean, the audience can see you more clearly. Okay. Uh, if you can do that for me, let's see. Okay, I'll try. Wait, I think you should do it from okay. your screen. Yeah, great. Okay, is that good? Excellent. That's okay. excellent. So, so uh, people that were talking about, uh, again, the hydroxychloroquine, uh, uh, there is a new study or, uh, being uh, evaluated and showing that maybe hydroxychloroquine is not effective in treating COVID-19. But there was some uh, criticism on that paper uh, being on uh, very ill patients and terminal cases. Uh, so that's why maybe the failure of the treatments. So what is your take on such, I mean, uh, a scenario of people saying it's like effective, others for the team to be yeah. ineffective. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to it. There's a lot of bad science out there. I think when the first data was reported from China, and I'm not even sure it was published, um, but it was reported uh, at meetings from China, um, the data was very good. And that's why the French did those open label studies. And their data was very good for hydroxychloroquine. And then, you know, our president spoke about it and everybody made fun of him. Um, and there's a lot of reason to make fun of him, but you know, you don't want that to affect your treatment. And I don't know the answer, but suddenly, you know, you have the New England Journal of Medicine publishing an article they should never have published. You know, you have, um, you know, and it's the best journal in the world. I mean, a you know, phenomenal journal. And uh, and they published that, uh, you know, article about hydroxychloroquine. At least I'm told they published it. I got an advanced copy of this article that I thought was a very poorly done study. Um, so I think we don't know the answer. You know, Anthony Fauci, uh, who's been the spokesperson for the uh, NIH and, and CDC here in the United States, um, has said, you know, the trials weren't well done so we don't have an answer. And I think that that's probably the only accurate thing we can say. We don't know if it works. We don't know if it makes it work. There's a question about uh, uh, younger people with uh, skin signs. They uh, they have like uh, symptoms and signs at the acral areas. So why young population, they have such presentation? It's, it's like a good, it's a reflection of a good immunity or something else. No, they they actually, if they get the COVID toes and fingers, which we have seen in young patients a lot, actually, many, I have many photos of it. Um, to me, uh, they're, that's almost a good sign because it so, shows that we're getting small microthrombi only affecting those areas and the big organs are unaffected. Um, so, and, uh, you know, as the, on the other hand, I showed you that shin in a very ill patient who had a large vessel, large thrombus, and that patient was badly affected. Um, so the microthrombi, I think, are, are not uh, dangerous, but clearly COVID-19 causes a coagulation abnormality that causes clots to form, even in young people. Uh, there's a question about uh the role of spironolactone in treating COVID-19 disease. Do, do you yeah. have any comment on that? This is the same story as hydroxychloroquine. When this started, <laughs> okay. spironolactone is known to increase that ACE2, which is an enzyme involved in coronavirus entering tissues. And 
Um, and because it increased that enzyme, people thought, oh, people, it's going to make patients worse. Now the articles are saying maybe it's protective against coronavirus infection. So I don't know the answer. I showed you the article which uh, raised the question that it might be protective. There's a question about there is any relation between the race and the severity of the illness. Arabians are less affected than European or blacks, I mean, versus whites. So yeah. do you have... Uh, so, there, so there are several lines of data that su suggest differences. So I'm going to say, first of all, in New York City, uh, um, a lot of the frontline healthcare workers, nurses, people who sit at our front desks, secretaries are black or Hispanic. So they are really exposed more than others. Um, first of all, there are certainly, certainly parts of the city where healthcare delivery is not as good and they are overwhelmingly uh, black and Hispanic. And so they're, you know, people are pointing to that as a factor, which it might be. Um, uh, I, yeah, I will say that, uh, you know, at, that certainly at the hospital that I work in uh, prides itself on uh, being equal opportunity for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or black or white or yellow, uh, you know, that everybody gets the same care. Um, the, um, the, the third factor to consider, there's socioeconomic factors. So um, if the, the people who are likely to have gone to their summer homes, which are far away from New York City, are much more likely to be white. And that's a socioeconomic factor. They are more likely to have summer homes. They are, uh, on average, wealthier, uh, and uh, and there is uh, a lack of equality there. And the last factor, which may play a role, is it has been said that an um, androgen receptors play a role in the ability of coronavirus to to penetrate uh, the lungs uh, and the body. And um, and uh, at least one source. Uh, claims that androgen receptors are increased in black individuals compared to Caucasian individuals. And that all of those may all play a role. So I, I don't know that it, that it has been looked at in, uh, in uh, Middle Eastern people. Um, uh, so I don't know if Arabs have more of that or less of that than others, but that's what has been claimed in uh, African Americans. There's a question about any mucosal changes or manifestations associated with COVID-19. And I think... Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think if we have known of any... Uh, patients do get pharyngitis and they get a, a sore throat, uh, but I don't remember if we've seen anything on the oral mucosa. I think... Uh, we are up with questions here. And uh, at uh, the end of this uh, session, I would like to uh, greatly thank our uh, special guest uh, speaker, Professor Mark Lepaul for his uh, time and also for sharing his uh, uh, great experience, especially with this I mean, uh, pandemic, which is uh, information is needed from all over the world. So thank you for your uh, information. Thank you for your knowledge and also practice and share it with us and uh, in the same time uh, we'd like to also to thank all the attendees here we have more than 700 uh, attendees uh, from uh, 28 countries so we hope we have added something to help the whole world with this pandemic uh, again thank you so much and on behalf of the Saudi Society of Dermatology and Dermatology we'd like to see you again thank you Mark thank you very much De delighted to be delighted I wish I was there in person but delighted to participate I'll invite you. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye now.